back here at the Ruger Gallery at the National Firearms Museum here in Fairfax, Virginia at NRA headquarters. I'm here with Phil Schreier, the senior curator here. And Phil, we're, we're kind of pulling the curtain back, taking a look at Hollywood Guns. It's, it's an incredible collection here, extended, an extended run of this collection here at the Firearms Museum. And, and we're, we're talking stories about the, the films, the firearms, and today the props. And, and Phil, you, it, it's hard to do a Hollywood Guns without talking a lot of Clint Eastwood, because he's, I mean, across from, from the cowboy stuff, the spaghetti westerns, all the way through, he is such a force. And, and, and today, you've got two neat things. We've got a prop from one of his films and a firearm from another one. So let's get started with uh, what's in that box? What's in this box? In this box is uh, the most significant, the highest award of valor this country can give to a service member. Uh, it is not won, it is earned, the Medal of Honor. It's a lot of times it's called the Congressional Medal of Honor, and that's a misnomer. It is the Medal of Honor. Uh, it was instituted uh, during the American Civil War in 1864, I think was the, uh, the first year it was actually given out. Uh, awards were given out retroactively going all the way back to First Manassas, which just occurred down the street from here. Uh, it's changed a number of times over the year in the way it's looked and been presented. Uh, this piece, some of you metal experts at home, military historians, will immediately notice there's something just not right about this one. Uh oh. Uh, and that's the, uh, the, the stars here kind of in a, a little messed up uh, uh, configuration. Uh, but the, uh, uh, this metal is a prop mm -hmm. because uh, recent federal re regulations. Uh, make it illegal to trade or transfer uh, medals of valor wow. uh, and makes it a felony crime punishable by prison uh, to, to wear a medal of valor that you haven't earned. Uh, and so Hollywood, they still got to tell the story. Absolutely. You know, and, uh, you know, from the time that John Wayne walked out of, uh, you know, out of his, uh, his, little, his little cabin there at, uh, at Fort Apache, you know, and she wore a yellow ribbon, you know, as Captain York. You know, he wears that Medal of Honor. You can even, he reads the inscription off the back of it. Uh, in fact, we, we know where that Medal of Honor is. It's a real one that was never issued. Wow. You know, the, the company that made it manufactured so many of them. They gave away thousands during the Civil War years. Uh, and the Indian Wars afterwards, uh, that there were a lot of unissued Medals of Honor. And uh, so that was never given to somebody, but it was acquired and had the inscription for the John Wayne film put on the back. This particular piece is of the Army design. Uh, the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force each have their own uh, special design uh, for their Medals of Honor. Uh, the blue ribbon and the hanging device, uh, the, the ribbon at the throat came uh, prior to World War II. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, Theodore Roosevelt really cleaned up the, the Medal of Honor, making it as venerable as it is today. This one was made for Clint Eastwood to wear in 1986 film Heartbreak Ridge. A great film. Oh, oh a fantastic geez. film. Now, a lot of, again, our military historians are going out there, they're going, that's an Army medal. The Marine Corps would have worn a Navy medal. Where's the anchor that should be right here instead of on? Well, that's because, go back and watch the movie now. When he earned that medal, he earned it in Korea. He was with the Army. He switches to the Marine Corps later on in his military career, and that's why he's gunning highway right. and, you know, during the attack on, on Grenada. Uh, so this, now, but you know what? You never see him wear it. This was made for him for the film. Mm -hmm. he, at the uh, one scene where he uh, goes in, uh, in, in, in dress blues, uh, he has the campaign ribbon, or on the campaign ribbon you know, bar, the ribbon bar, the Medal of Honor in the top position of mm -hmm. precedence. Uh, nothing outranks it. Uh, but he doesn't wear the medal at the neck, which is the, 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 the individual holding the medals, you know, that's his prerogative. Yeah, his discretion. Uh, yeah. But he has it on the uniform. This was made for him to wear it at the neck. He declined to do so for the film. Or if he did, that one scene never made it into the final right. cut. 
But that was the. Uh, but the prop lives on. The prop and lives the on. Yeah. Awesome. So what else do you have for and, us? And 20 years later, Clint would uh, go to Iceland in 2005 to film uh, the movies, two movies, almost simultaneously, that came out in 2006. Flags of Our Fathers, telling the story of James Brady and the, uh, the guys that, uh, or James Bradley and the guys that uh, uh, raised the, uh, the flag oh, yeah. on Mount Suribachi, the mm -hmm. second flag raising on, on Suribachi, the famous Rosenstahl photo of, uh, of, of the flag raising there. And uh, the other movie was told uh, from the Japanese point of view uh, called Letters from Iwo Jima. Flags of Our Fathers, Letters from Iwo Jima, yeah. 2006. This is a, uh, a baby Nambu uh, pistol. Uh, that was used in letters from Iwo Jima by one of the Japanese officers. It's a baby. Uh, yeah, it's the smallest it's, one I've ever seen. It, it, it's a really neat uh, Nambu. It has been blank adapted. Sometimes on a lot of these rare guns that are just there for show, they're not going to be fired. You know, they won't blank adapt. Uh, right. But it's a rare gun and has been blank adapted. But you know, the, the, the prop house owns it. Yep. Do what they want with it. And this Needs gun, to earn a living. This gun's <laughs> got to earn a living. Absolutely right. Uh, so that that uh, it, it's nice that the mum is still on the uh, the breach here. You know, a lot of vet bringbacks from the Pacific Theater uh, had to have the mum ground off, mm -hmm. uh, but the mum's still good on this. Um, a lot of interesting hardware. Uh, you know, I, I would love to be able to sit down with Clint Eastwood and actually talk to him about guns. Uh, just how much influence does he have in the types of guns that are being used in his films? He's obviously uh, somebody that, that appreciates yes. firearms. Uh, but you notice that in, in, in a lot of the films the last 30 years he's made, starting with like Josie Wales, he hasn't been just pulling something off the prop truck or just taking whatever the guy you know handed him to use. He shows up with uh, 51 Navy Colts when everybody's using a 73 single action. He's got a Schofield. In fact, he caused the price of Star Revolvers to go absolutely crazy uh, when Unforgiven came out because there's a Star Revolver behind his back on the uh, on the one sheet uh, for for Unforgiven. Uh, you used to be able to buy those old pistols for three five hundred dollars a piece. You can't touch them for for twice, uh, twice, you know, thousand or more anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, every movie has something really interesting and correct in it. In fact, Flags of Our Fathers and Letters from Iwo Jima, uh, one of my very own guns is in there. Wow. I have uh, the, the Japanese 99 machine guns are so rare and their magazines even rarer. Mm -hmm. uh, I had uh, I had a Japanese 99 with two functioning magazines. Wow! And uh, well, in my effort to uh, uh, go to Iraq and be the American Rifleman War Correspondent, I sold the Jap 99 to pay for my trip. <laughs> and it was the you see a Japanese machine gun in either of those movies. That's my old machine. Wow. gun. Wow. Yeah, that is too cool. So uh, a little bit of full circle on the flags um, of our fathers, the medal, uh, wow. and uh, on Hollywood machine guns. Awesome, that is so great, Phil. Thank you for sharing this wonderful information about the firearms, the props, the movies here, Hollywood guns. Tell folks how they can see this. Well, we'd like for you to come by in person and help make 2011 our best year yet in our 76-year history here. We're located about 15 miles away from Washington D.C. at the intersection of Route 66 and 50 in Fairfax County, Virginia. We're open seven days a week from 9.30 to 5, free admission and ample parking. And if you can't visit us in person, visit us on the web 24-7 uh, at nramuseum.org. Phil Schreier, thank you once again for a great installment of Hollywood Guns and a great installment of The Curator's Corner. Thank you, John.